So hello, welcome to our online birds and beer. So I am Morgan Moore and I work for Audubon Arizona, the state office of the National Audubon Society. Our mission is to protect birds and the places they need today and tomorrow using science, advocacy, education, and on the ground conservation. For the new folks, Birds and Beer has been our monthly conservation happy hour lecture series that was once held in person at our nature center with beer. There is no virtual beer today, but the title remains. Like most things around us, our Rio Salado Audubon Center in Phoenix is closed, but our work continues. And while we get through this COVID pandemic, I hope you, your family, and your friends are all staying safe and healthy and finding some peace and enjoyment and virtual opportunities like this one. I'm going to give a bit of an introduction for Audubon and our special connection to this month's topic. But first I wanna point out that if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. We are also streaming this on Facebook Live. So if you're watching on Zoom and having technical issues, try visiting facebook.com. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded again and will also be available on our Facebook as soon as it's done streaming. Okay, so across the arid west and particularly in Arizona, rivers, wetlands, lakes, and riverside habitat are of outsized importance to birds. If you're a bird in the arid west, you need a place with water at some point in your life cycle. So Audubon has a Western Water Initiative and within that is our Western Rivers Action Network to help us protect rivers and waterways across the West for birds, other wildlife and people because we happen to need water as well. I'll throw in a plug that you can join the Western, Western Rivers Action Network to help us in our efforts to protect water and habitat for birds. And you should be able to see the link there on the screen. And when we talk about the birds in the arid west that need places with water, we're talking about countless species, but here are some of our priority species here. The federally endangered Yuma subspecies of the Ridgeways rail here being one of them. This bird also gives us a chance to focus on some overlooked places with water. So you'll hear us say rivers, lakes, and streams a lot, but places with water in the arid west that birds need might also be wetlands, as well as farms, groundwater recharge basins, even irrigation ditches and canals. So over a year ago, Audubon Arizona launched a project to evaluate suitable habitat for the Yuma Ridgeways Rail on the Gila River using both annual marsh bird surveys and geographic information systems mapping. So you should be able to see a map um, on the screen there with our lower Salt and Gila Rivers ecosystem important bird area um, where we were doing some of this mapping. And our goal has been to gather and analyze data on where the rail goes and then develop a science-driven action plan with specific recommendations for habitat conservation and restoration. Tonight's speaker, Eamon Harity, is a research biologist for the University of Idaho. He has been fortunate enough to work with the UMA Ridgeways Rail since 2016, first as a graduate student and now as a research biologist. And these charismatic marsh birds never cease to fascinate, fascinate and surprise him, or us for that matter. Last year, some of my colleagues got to tag along with Eamon during his process of catching, banding, and adding trackers to the rails. His work has allowed us to greatly improve our habitat suitability model or map by increasing the known locations of habitat occupied by rails on the Gila River before they flew south to Mexico. So I can't express how grateful we are to partner with Eamon other than to stop talking and give him the floor. So take it away, Eamon. All right, thank you, Morgan. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. That'll be the big Thing that I need to figure out here. Is it uh, 
Where actually is that share the screen mode, Morgan? So it should be on the Zoom window that you're at, at the bottom where all of the controls are. Uh -huh. There should be a bright green button. Oh, yes. So share screen. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Does that work? All right. Uh, well, Perfect. thanks everyone for joining and thank you, Morgan, for the introduction. Um, I'm here to talk a bit about some really exciting research that's taken me and colleagues throughout the Southwest for starting in the sort of lower Colorado River, but it's as expanded beyond what we expected. Um, and of course, the, the star of the show is, is as Morgan mentioned, the, the Yuma Ridgeways Rail, it's a bit of a mouthful. I put my name and email up here if anyone has questions and wants to follow up. Uh, with anything we talk about today, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw that back up on the screen um, at the end of the presentation. And, and also, I want to point out that <clears throat> throughout this talk, I have some really stunning, surprisingly good photos of, of rails, and I can't really take credit for any of them. Uh, we've had either field technicians, volunteers, or just avid birders involved in uh, the, bird, the rail project for a number of years, and so they get the credit for these amazing photos. And, and secondly, this bird, it's not common that you could actually get to see it like this. This is one of my favorite rail photos because it more accurately depicts what you might actually see um, with uh, a Yuma rail. And you can see it right here if it didn't pop out at first. These are secretive birds and they're, they can be really tricky to actually see uh, in the wild. Uh, but to set some context, I want to talk briefly about the Endangered Species Act. This is a pivotal uh, environmental legislation uh, set in place in the 60s, and it, it's critical for import, uh, for protecting the vulnerable species uh, in North America. And, and really, it's, it's a model that has been expanded throughout the world. Uh, and there's some really charismatic examples like the, per, uh, the peregrine falcon, the grizzly bear, Canadian lynx. Uh, here in Idaho, where I am now, the, the steelhead, and then the yellow-billed cuckoo. And, Yet to implement the Endangered Species Act effectively, we really need a lot of information. First and foremost, we need to understand why a species is rare. And this sort of requires that we understand its full annual life cycle, where it spends the summers, where it spends the winters, the types of habitat and prey items that it depends on. And, and while this is well documented in some species and has allowed us to recover uh, a, a number of species, it's, it's incredibly difficult to gather this information and, and then turn it into useful management, especially if the creature or the, the species is rare, cryptic, or, and or migratory. And, and if it's migratory, then our whole, our whole scope of research expands dramatically. And a really good example of that is this Yuma Ridgeways Rail, as we've, as we've talked about as the star of today's show. Now, this bird has been federally endangered for, for going on 50 years, uh, more than 50 years, since 1967. And for any Endangered Species Act nerds out there, this actually predates the version we have now. This is one of the founding uh, members, if you will, of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, a dubious honor, but an honor nonetheless. Uh, with, and so the, the population is, is quite small. There's fewer than a thousand individuals detected um, in the, in the United States during the last survey window. Uh, and this bird it loves these early successional emergent wetland habitats, uh, which as Morgan mentioned, aren't that common in the arid Southwest. And this, this bird is found spanning from Northern Mexico and the, the Delta of the Colorado River all the way up into Nevada with a few disparate populations around the Salton Sea or up here at Ash Meadows uh, in Nevada. And that like a lot of species uh, in, in the world, really, uh, this, the rail is threatened by habitat loss and degradation. And along the Colorado River, the primary drivers of that will, are going to be damming, uh, river regulation, channelization, uh, just conversion of, of habitat in these, emer these floodplains that once supported numerous marshes into agriculture. Um, and add to that, the rails are, are true homebodies, or at least that's what we thought. They have largely been described as 
is non-migratory and they rarely, if ever, leave the marsh. As I mentioned before, it's, it's hard to see them. Uh, and part of that is just because they never leave that dense vegetation. And so because of this, and you, with this knowledge in mind, conservation has largely focused on preserving these emergent marsh habitats. So for example, this is a refuge here, and I know that it might look like a, a series of farm fields, but that's the Colorado River coming down here. And on the side here, these panels or these parcels of land are actually cattail or bulrush. So instead of farming corn and soybeans, we farm cattails for these for these birds. And, and another example here from the Salton Sea, it's hard to pick this out of, the, out of this checkerboard of agriculture, but this is a small marsh parcel that we have converted or the proverbial, we, I wasn't actually involved in that, but the management agencies have turned old ag fields into marshes that they manage for the rails and for other species. But there's just, just not a lot of habitat, but this is what we focused on because these birds, to the best of our knowledge, they never left. So doing this was sufficient. And, and these efforts have been successful. The population has been small, but it's been stable. It hasn't been declining. It's been hovering around that 700, 800, 1,000 birds uh, for, for decades. Uh, but while we've been doing all of this management and focusing all of our conservation dollars on maintaining this quality habitat for the rail, something else has been going on in the desert. And we'll give you, you know, a couple seconds to think about this. It's really hot. There's a lot of open and arid lands. What goes really well in that situation? And the answer is, is solar. Um, we built a lot of solar facilities in the desert southwest. And this map of utility scale, so that means just really, really large scale solar facilities in the desert, this map shows just how expansive this solar facility network really is. And you can see in particular, this arid southwest area of California, Nevada, and Arizona, there's a lot of solar there. And for good reason, it's, as anyone, as anyone who has spent time in the Southwest will know, it's a little bit warm down there. This map uh, of the US with the reds and the yellows shows solar potential. And basically that just means how much sunlight the place gets. And you see that that rail home, so border of California, Arizona, Southern Nevada, some of the hottest, best places for solar out there. And so a lot of solar has developed and that's largely been seen as a good thing. We like clean, renewable sources of energy, but there have been some unexpected consequences, um, namely, so sorry, let me restart there. There's been some unintended consequences and part of this is because this giant solar facility might look like something else to birds flying over the desert. And it, it kind of already looks like this, but it, is known as the oasis effect or the lake effect where birds flying up high in the sky over these open areas, they confuse solar facilities with bodies of water. They approach and either die from impact trauma or they, they land and get disoriented and confused. And it's well known actually that birds die at solar facilities. Some, it's estimated that roughly 60,000 die every year just in Southern California. And it's a wide breadth of species, more than 180 were documented at just two or three facilities in Southern Arizona over the course of four years, or Southern California, rather. And surprisingly, 44% of those birds were what we call water birds. And that it's surprising because these solar facilities are in the open desert. But when you think about these solar facilities, perhaps looking like a, a body of water, it, it makes sense that disproportionate number of water birds are actually attracted and drawn in to these solar panels and facilities. But what might all this have to do with our rail? This is a homebody marsh bird that never leaves the cattail. It clearly can't be affected by solar panels or solar facilities out in the open desert. But lo and behold, in, in 2014, we did indeed document a, a, a mortality of a Yuma rail at a solar facility and shortly thereafter a second bird was found dead and reported from a different solar facility out in the desert. And so 
Not only was this surprising, uh, but it also spurred a bunch of legal action because the Yuma rail is endangered. And when an endangered bird is, is taken or is killed by industry or anything, it, it, it kind of initiates a series of actions. And so there was a slurry of popular news articles. There were a handful of uh, litigations and lawsuits just to figure out what was happening. And it really was the impetus for our study and for me coming on as a, a naive grad student, uh, excited to chase these birds around the desert because we really needed to figure out, are these birds really such homebodies? Are they, are they staying in the marshes or are they leaving them more than we expect? And just to put these, de these mortalities in context, these bright pink stars represents where the birds were detected or sorry, where these birds died. And so the top, the northernmost star is at desert sunlight. That's a massive utility grade or uh, scale solar facility. And it's, it's 50 kilometers or more from any known populations of rail. So it really surprised people that a rail would end up there. And then the, the second one, a little bit further south, closer to the Salton Sea was perhaps less surprising, but nonetheless, it, it, it really begged the question of what's going on? Why are these birds leaving the marshes and that was the question we came into uh, with uh, for this research project. So we thought, well, maybe it's maybe it's dispersal. So dispersal would be post-breeding movements of, of juveniles or subor subordinate adults kind of moving somewhat randomly in search of new habitat, uh, be it a new place to breed and a new place to find food. And these movements would be sort of non-directional. They would just be scattered across uh, the range. Or maybe these birds are more migratory than we previously thought. Maybe they're following the river corridors and moving south in, in the winters and then moving back north in the springs and summers. And then finally, the other option is that these birds are migratory, but rather than following any of the river corridors, they're just moving straight across the open desert, which would be really surprising, but perhaps explain these mortalities a bit better. And again, migration in different, it's different from dispersal in that it's, it's directional, it's, it's south uh, in the winter, and then it's back north in, in the summer or the following spring. And again, it, it's got this seasonal component. And so we might be asking, why, why do we care if it's dispersal or migration, if the birds are leaving the marshes, that's all we need to know, right? We just need to know the frequency with which they leave, but dispersal is really hard to predict. It's, it's somewhat random, it can occur at any time of year, and it doesn't give managers very much information to work with if they're planning for future sightings of where to allow development or, or mitigation act actions at existing facilities. Whereas migration, uh, that's, that's predictable in space and time, right? That happens every fall and every spring. And if we can document that and we can describe that in the species, that provides actionable information that we can use to, to better manage and conserve the species. And finally, it also informs the portion or the proportion of the population. Uh, where it, so dispersal, expect mostly juveniles. Migration is going to be adults um, and really everyone moving if it is migration. So with this in mind, we set about, well, the next big question is how do we actually get our hands on, on one of these birds? These are secret of marsh birds and you can see from this photo, it's a great photo by Dan Height from the Audubon, but they don't like to leave the marsh. They're hard to find. Uh, for the most part, the most you can hope for is maybe finding their footsteps as, as proof that they're in an area. And if you do see them, they're, they're fast as lightning and they're zipping across an open space, just giving you a glimpse. And then finally, if they do come out and they do want to cooperate, they catch you when you're not paying attention as happened with this great photo again by Dan. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time figuring out, well, how do we get our hands on these birds? And it turns out, well, you need to spend more time than you'd like deep down and dirty in the marsh vegetation, swamping around, and you need good, reliable friends and colleagues to work with you. So, you know, you've just got these 
really gung-ho interns that are willing to just get down and dirty and deep into the marsh with you, especially Joe out there up to his chest in water, Laura and Michael, uh, Maddie, and some of the great help we've had kayaking up and down these rivers, Carlo helping me along the Gila River, uh, braving, braving the conditions for, for more than, well, four summers actually. We chase these birds all over their range. Um, and ironically, we attach solar powered transmitters to them. So these birds showing up dead at solar facilities was the uh, sort of incentive to start this research project. And we thought, well, let's just bring the solar right to them and put it right on their backs. Um, and these, these solar powered transmitters are incredible. They're, they're tiny, they're less than five grams and they transmit data remotely to a satellite network so I can play sort of armchair, armchair biologist once we get the transmitters actually on the birds. We put them on and then every couple of days I just log on to an online server and I can track the movements in, in almost real time. It's, it's pretty exciting and actually this time of year when we're expecting some spring migration, I, it's the first thing I do every day. I wake up and I, I check on my rails to see where they are and, and how they're doing. Um, and so we did this at a lot of areas, a lot of field sites as seen on this map on the right here from La Cienega de Santa Clara in Mexico, all the way up to Overton Wildlife Management Area in Ash Meadows in Nevada. And we distributed transmitters on adults, males and females, on juveniles in, in hopes of documenting and describing the proportion of the population that was moving and the timing of those movements. And as you can see, we we tracked fairly closely with the range, the entire geographic range of the species uh, because we weren't sure uh, just when and where these birds would be moving. And so now what? What happens now? Uh, and unfortunately, fortunately, uh, however you want to look at it, for the first nearly two years of the project, not a lot happened. We spent a lot of hours in the marsh, chased a lot of birds around, um, but we just couldn't we didn't document anything. Uh, and then finally, this bird, I'll call him number 422, a male we captured near Phoenix, pretty much made, made my day, made my month uh, when I woke up one morning and started, I noticed that he was on the move. So for, this is Basin Meridian Wildlife Area. It's, it's really close to Phoenix. This map is a little bit hard to spatial reference, but that blue dot is just to the west of Phoenix. Um, and this bird, was a male, we captured it during the breeding season in 2018. And it started just sort of moving around a little bit more than you might expect. And it made this jump of 50 kilometers, which was mind blowing to me because at, up to that point, the furthest movement we'd ever documented was like 500 kilometers or 500 meters, not 50 kilometers. And then he just kept going south. He moved 270 more kilometers, spent some time, a little bit further and then ended up all the way down near Los Mochis in Sinaloa, Mexico in some mangrove forests. It's 920 kilometers over the course of a couple weeks and he covered more than 500 kilometers in 24 hours and, and to anyone who's not spent a lot of time with these birds this might seem like oh hum that's not that impressive um, but <laughs> these rails they don't fly. I was shocked to know that they can fly a hundred meters, let alone 500 kilometers. Uh, they, they are one of the birds with the strongest leg muscles per body size ratio in, on the, in the world, just because they never use their wings. So the fact that they could fly almost a thousand kilometers um, in a few weeks was really mind blowing to, to a lot of us. Um, and so also mind blowing was just the, the choices of habitat. And so the transmitters provide pretty precise locations and we were able to see that this bird stopped in a drainage canal, like Morgan mentioned, these in the arid southwest, water being so scarce, birds and wildlife have to adapt. And so this bird clearly stopped uh, at this little drainage canal uh, just there near an ag field. And then what was really shocking uh, was this bird spent two weeks um, in this area. And I remind you, these birds are considered marsh specialists. They spend all their time in these cattails, emergent sedges and bulrushes, 
And so to see this bird stop and then spend nearly two weeks in this desert arroyo, desert scrub, really blew my mind. In fact, I was convinced that it was dead uh, and just, you know, blowing around in the wind is why the transmitter was registering activity. But nope, the bird spent two weeks in this seemingly inhospitable area and then continued on all the way down to a mangrove marsh near Los Mochis, like I mentioned. Uh, and I'll just further follow that up and say, rails really know how to pick a vacation spot. So this is an aerial photo. I didn't take it, unfortunately, but it shows the, the mangrove marshes near Playa El Marivi, which is where this rail ended up. And it was, again, this is the first migration we'd ever seen in the species, first use of salt marshes in the species. So we were all really excited. And while we were still recovering from the excitement of this movement, we had another bird um, from Havasu National Wildlife Refuge move, complete another remarkable uh, movement. It, it moved over 700 kilometers to, to another mangrove forest near Bahia Kino and then continued, continued on to another marsh near that, that first bird. Um, and again, it spent a month in Bahia Kino, which is this really beautiful mangrove. It's actually a, a Ramsar site, which is sort of like a world heritage site for wetlands. Um, so it's a stunning uh, intact mangrove marsh in coastal Mexico and it overwintered near Los Mochis. Uh, so again, these were two somewhat groundbreaking movements for these rails. And if we return to our first, uh, the first bird, 422, that started at Basin Meridian in, in that following spring after overwintering in the mangroves, it started heading home and it made a jump across the bay and then moved up north. And again, it stopped in this desert scrub, which is really shocking. Stopped in an agricultural field and then ended up breeding along the Gila River, approximately 30 kilometers west of where it bred in 2018. And again, it, it just covered a just a stunning amount of distance in a very short time window. And as I mentioned, it stopped in this ag field and, and somewhat interestingly and, and surprisingly, it was less than two kilometers apart during its spring and fall migration. It stopped in, this, in these ag fields and, and apparently foraged and then continued on its way. But this photo also really brings home just how altered that landscape really is. There's, there's not much arid, arable land that is not converted uh, into this gridlock of egg fields and these rails are somehow finding a way either taking advantage of freshly irrigated farm fields or, or irrigation canals um, to survive out here. And so we'll continue on and I'll just wrap up the story of 667 here. He overwintered and then again started flying north and he, he completed a remarkably quick migration. Again, it was just three to four days all the way back north and it ended up breeding within a couple hundred meters of where we captured it in, in 2018 um, and covered an immense amount of, of land. Um, and again, for some species, this isn't that long of a migration, but for rails, particularly Ryuma rails out west, this was unprecedented and pretty remarkable. And again, it was, it was almost 2,000 kilometers of round trip movement, which is, which is pretty neat. And it was the first documented migration in the species. It, it challenged the existing paradigm. In fact, it, it, it broke the existing paradigm that these birds are homebodies that live in their marshes all year round um, and showed that at least some of them are migrating vast distances over uh, the open desert. And that it, it provides really important data for managers in this effort to preserve and conserve this species. And like I mentioned, it, it confirmed that these birds are crossing vast expanses of the open desert. And since then, we've, we've documented more than 23 migra migratory movements of rails going everywhere from 20 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. Um, 10 of those have initiated in the US, uh, mostly along the lower Colorado, but several have started out near the Phoenix area. Uh, 10 have moved and down into Mexico, 
eight movements just within the U.S., somewhat shorter. Uh, and then also we expanded the work in New Mexico and, and we had five birds this past fall move from the Delta, the Colorado River Delta to mangrove marshes uh, further south. And, and while some of these movements weren't complete, as you notice, some of these dots just sort of disappear into the desert. Migration is a, is a very dangerous thing for a bird to complete. And so I think we, we're seeing some of that as, as not all of the rails are surviving uh, their full migratory uh, movements. But not only did we document these movements, we also found out some really, some really interesting things, namely the surprising choice of habitat during migration. So this is again, a marsh bird. And I don't know if that's clear, but this dark line here that goes sort of east to west across this image is, is I-10, a, a big freeway in the, in, in the whole country, really. And this bird, each one of these dots represents a, roughly about 24 hours. And so this bird from Havasu spent one day in this windbreak and the next day at this windbreak uh, and then continued on. And we actually had one of our colleagues go in and track it down another place. It spent a couple days and it spent about 36 hours in this desert arroyo, which is shocking. And there doesn't seem to be much water or marsh vegetation there, uh, but somehow the bird managed to survive a few days in this area. We also documented regular use of egg fields, and this is perhaps less surprising. It's, it's generally really close to these ag, or these the emergent marshes. Uh, in fact, this Gila River comes around through here, and there's little patches of emergent marshes along here. But this bird opted to spend a lot of time. Again, each one of these dots represents roughly 24 hours of time. And this bird spent several weeks in these egg fields and we had one of a, a local birder named Caleb go out and he found that the rail was spending most of its time in a cotton field, uh, which was unexpected. Uh, the, the, the next important sort of vegetation class that these birds are using are these desert oases. Again, water is a really scarce and limited resource, um, particularly in the Sonoran Desert, which spans all through here. There's, just really not much water. And so some, yet somehow these rails are finding these tiny little irrigation ponds. Uh, ranchers and much of Sonora make these little impoundments to feed their cattle or to water their cattle among other uses. And if you look at the scale on this map here, it's, uh, you know, it's, this pond is no more than hundred meters across yet. Somehow this rail essentially beelined it and landed right, spent right at this little pond, spent four or five days and then continued on uh, to another pond further south. It was remarkable. And he spent another couple of weeks there before continuing on um, his way south. We also documented these birds using salt marshes and mangroves and, and rails in the literature and in natural history accounts, they're described as a freshwater marsh bird, but they're using clearly using saltwater marshes and brackish water marshes and everything from these estuaries uh, where they are dominated by this salt grass and salicornius, really short statured vegetation um, to, to mangrove marshes uh, with a variety of different heights and, and conditions of the mangroves. So these birds are su showing surprising flexibility uh, in their habitat choices and in movement um, decisions. And the other reason this is really important information is that salt marshes and mangroves in coastal Mexico are a pretty uncommon. There's not a lot of, of them. Uh, and also they're, they're increasingly threatened by development, either for subdivisions or just hotel development. And then also for shrimp farming. Shrimp farming is a, is a really popular or important industry in the Gulf of California here. And a recent estimate suggests that over 95% of all mangroves in northern Mexico are negatively affected, if not downright destroyed, by these shrimp farming efforts. And so it's an important additional piece of information for the conservation of this, of this rail. And so in summary, these habitat specialists, as they're described, um, are showing remarkable flexibility. They're using agricultural fields, desert oases, these little ponds, um, and then salt marshes and, and mangrove marshes. And then one of my favorite examples is 
this bird spent two weeks on a golf course. I would have paid an immense amount of money uh, to go spend time and see this rail, you know, just walking around a golf course. That would have really made, made my day. But I'll just go back to this slide quickly and, and say that there aren't many species, particularly habitat specialists that show this much variation in, in habitat choice throughout the year. These birds seem to have sort of three or four distinct habitats, emergent marshes during the breeding season, then these sort of desert oases and, and arroyos during migration, and finally salt marshes and mangrove forests um, during the winter months. And that, that degree of, of variation and, and difference in these habitats is surprising, particularly for a bird that is described as such a habitat specialist. So we'll, we'll move forward through this golfing rail again and just do a, a quick little summary of how many we've seen move so far. We've got about 40% of the adults that we put transmitters on have moved. Um, fewer of the juveniles, just about 14, 20% of those have been moving for a, a total of roughly 36% of the birds that we've attached transmitters to and that have survived through the fall have been migrating, uh, which, is, which is pretty remarkable. It's a non-trivial proportion of the population. But again, so what? This is neat natural history information. Rare bird is migrating. Great, that's, that's exciting to bird nerds, but, but why do we care? Um, and if we, if we think back again in the context of solar development and solar facilities and, and the reason we initiated this study, we see that these birds, they're migrating through an area that already has substantial solar development. For example, this Puerto Libertad, I think it's this solar facility, it might be this other one that's partially hidden by the rail, but that's 2.4 square kilometers. That's like, that's an, it's an, a massive amount of land covered by solar panels. It's something like 250 football fields stacked adjacent to each other. And so these rails are already navigating a landscape fraught with challenges and it's likely to, to continue. Again, this map showing solar potential for the desert Southwest, we see that it's really hot. It's really great for solar and that's not necessarily a bad thing. We should encourage more development. It just should be done responsibly. And if we link about Arizona, California, and Nevada currently get roughly 16 to 25% of their energy from uh, solar sources, solar facilities. Um, and these are their goals in the near future. Arizona is going to go up to 50% by 2030, they hope. California has a very lofty goal of 100% by 2045. Nevada is a bit more modest, but it's still an increase. And then if we think about Mexico, now that we know these birds are not just a U.S. species, they're migrating down into Mexico, Mexico also has big plans to expand their solar. And we should encourage this. We, we like solar we like clean, clean energy. We just need to think a little bit about how we do this solar expansion um, so that we don't provide too much of a detriment to this endangered rail. And the research that we've been a part of is really providing actionable data. We've sort of defined this somewhat narrow geographic range through which these birds are migrating. Uh, we, well, A, we know they migrate, which we didn't know before, which is a huge help. Uh, we're, we've documented that they're traversing open desert. They're not following the river corridor or the coastline. They're just crossing the desert and they're stopping in the desert. We've kind of identified the timing. So far, we've seen movements in the fall between the 9th of September and the 3rd of November. And then in the spring, it's a narrower time window, but we also have a smaller sample size. But regardless, this is sort of defining in space and time when the rails are migrating. And finally, we've, we've figured out that over 90% of the birds that have completed long distance movements, they've all been doing that at night. And so these are really useful bits of information that we can use to ensure that solar energy, solar facility and the rails can coexist in the desert Southwest. For example, Perhaps this 
this corridor, we'll call it the rail migration corridor, is is an area to to either avoid when siting future facilities or think very carefully about how we place solar facilities on the landscape in this in this rail migration corridor or just planning for mitigation efforts. Maybe solar facilities um, turn off or go into lower production mode during these peak weeks of rail migration. And then finally, it may just allow us to plan for take, take being mortalities. If we're willing to accept the risk that we want solar more than we want to protect every single last rail, uh, which is a, a reasonable thing to think, um, this sort of information helps us plan for and account for building more solar facilities in this area, being fully informed that there's a real chance that it'll negatively affect a rail. These are things we can do um, to account for that. And finally, what I think is also a very important piece to this research is we've really figured out that this Yuma Ridgeways rail is not just a US species, it's a binational bird and any conservation efforts need to be coordinated with uh, our colleagues, our friends to the South, Mexico. And so to, on that vein, we initiated a research project this past winter, collaborating with some great organizations, Pro Natura Noroeste, CIAD, Navopatia, and then Arizona Game and Fish Department. And we actually got to go down to their wintering grounds and chase these birds around the mangroves instead of the cattails in an effort to learn more about their habitat use um, and movement patterns during the winter. And so I mentioned earlier that they, these rails really know how to pick a, a vacation spot and, and yes, they do. This is a terrible place I had to go to in February. I had to leave, you know, blustery, frigid Idaho and go down here and spend 10 days. It was, it was terrible, I didn't like it at all. Um, or, and I also got to spend a few days at the Navopatia field station, uh, which also was, was way, I would have way preferred to stay in the freezing cold weather of Northern Idaho. Um, and, and we had great luck. We weren't sure when we went down there if we'd have any luck finding and catching these birds, but I had great help from Pro Natura. Uh, and we boated around, we drove around, we hiked around through the mangroves. And we actually caught and put transmitters on five adult rails and we're currently monitoring their movements. Really excited to see if any of them migrate back to the US. Um, and, and we're just learning so much. This is a, we know little about the rails, but we know even less about the rails during the winter months uh, during, when they're down in Mexico. You can see in this photo here, that was the first rail we captured. I don't know if I've ever been that happy um, as when we captured that first rail down in Mexico. And so just to place that in space, like I said, we went down to Waimas and we put out three transmitters in this marsh and another couple further south. Um, and they're difficult to see, but each one of those pink dots is a daily location of the rails. And this is just to give you an example of, of what I see every day. I track these birds from my computer here in Boise, Idaho. Um, and eagerly anticipate any of the movements they might make. And so all of this research really comes back to that opening sort of discussion we had about the Endangered Species Act and how to successfully conserve, preserve, and hopefully recover uh, threatened or vulnerable species, we really need to know its full annual cycle and we need to implement conservation actions that protect at species throughout its entire life cycle. And so for these rails where management and conservation dollars have always focused on protecting and preserving emergent marshes along the Colorado River and Salton Sea and Gila River, which is immensely important, we may simply need to expand that effort and think about how we're placing solar facilities and, and think of the greater landscape for these birds during migration. And then we certainly need to think about and expand research and conservation efforts to the mangroves and salt marshes in northern Mexico where these birds are wintering. Um, and we, we are pushing in that direction. The research we've, we've been doing is novel and exciting, but it's, it's just a one step in the process. And so we're, we're hoping to continue this year. We'll certainly be continuing in 2021, but we're hoping to continue 
if we can this year as well. And so we've documented, like I said, migration from the sort of central part of their range. And we've documented both fall and spring migration, but we wanna keep going. And, and for that, we're continuing our efforts in 2020 and we're focusing on, on these Nevada birds from which we have not yet documented any movements. Um, we'll be expanding our research uh, down in Waimas. Uh, we've got some potential collaboration and we're hoping to go down the next several winters to, to put out more transmitters and learn more about the habitat and movement uh, behavior of the birds um, in this, this area. We're also tackling a genetic analysis um, to sort of complement this movement. So now that we know that these birds are migrating and going down to, to Mexico and coming back, we, we want to redo some genetic analyses to get a better idea of the population structure and then finally, what I'm quite excited about is we're adding a whole nother subspecies. Um, this is just one bird that lives along the Colorado River and there's another population that lives in San Diego. And so beginning this year, there's a new grad student on the project um, and a lot of interest uh, and a lot of collaboration. Uh, and so the Light-Footed Ridgeways Rail project should get up and running uh, and provide a really neat complement to this study that we've been carrying out along the Colorado River. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude and wrap up. And there's too many people to thank, the few big ones being US Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service um, for funding. Uh, and then a number of individuals have either provided the impetus to get this study going or have helped with the field uh, component. Um, really, it's been a collaborative effort and it would certainly not have been possible without a lot of help. And I hope some of the folks that have helped are on this, on this presentation. And I will open it up for questions. I guess you can either enter them in the, the chat box or we can turn on your microphones and uh, I, will, I will try my best to respond to any questions that you might have. Um, Thank you, Amen. That was awesome. Uh, just the amount of stuff that I just learned is is just an overwhelming amount. <laughs> and you are getting a lot of questions in the chat. So okay. um, we have a lot coming in in the chat. Um, I'm gonna keep everyone's mics off because that always ends up causing a lot of feedback okay. problems. Um, and anyone um, who has asked a question that we don't end up getting to, we will try and get back to you after the presentation if we don't answer it tonight. So I am going to start with, um, so you said that you had 63 rails total uh -huh. with transmitters. Um, how many, do you know how many are wearing transmitters currently, like at this exact moment? Yeah, that's a really good question. So these transmitters are, are, play, are um, it's a little bit challenging, I guess, to quantify that because we, these birds wear them hard. They're in. They're migrating. They're living in salt, salt water, fresh water, and so the, the transmitters have about a year to a year and a half lifespan. And so currently we have, I'd say, of those 63, we probably have about 15 with transmitters still, um, just because we they've either died, the transmitters have turned off, or the batteries and solar panels have expired. But we still have about 16 or 15. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you're going to pick up um, a second subspecies. Uh, Ice is actually asking, there is another subspecies of Ridgeways rail in Mexico. Yeah. Can you tell which was which when you captured the birds down there? That's a, a really, really good question um, about the subspecies. And so a lot of those subspecies distinctions were were put into place um, just using geographic information. So where they saw the Yuma rails on the Colorado River, and then where they had these similar birds down in Mexico. And so I could not tell the difference. We had sort of behavioral cues that some birds seemed like they were residents, they were paired, they seemed to be a little bit more territorial. And that those birds that we ran into may have been the, the Mexican subspecies, but that's one of the big reasons we're, we're starting this uh, genetic analysis is with the, the samples we've collected from Nevada all the way down now to Los Mochis, um, we, we have a pretty 
good setup to look more closely at the population structure and maybe clear up these subspecies distinctions and whether or not they really are separate subspecies, it's just one big species, or if they're, they're even more different than subspecies. Thank you. Uh, we have a few people asking about trapping. So where did you get the traps? And could you go into detail a little bit more about how exactly you ended up trapping the rails? Yeah, that is um, a good question. Trapping these birds is not a, a trivial task. And so we started, we first couple of years, we used uh, large cat traps, really. They're called tomahawk traps, all these big square traps that have doors on either side. And we put a little trip wire through them. So when the rails walked through, uh, they hit the tripwire and it closed the trap doors. And so that's a, a method that we uh, adapted and inherited from folks up in the San Francisco Bay. And also um, it's just, it's, it's a, a method that's been used uh, to capture rails for quite some time. Um, we, we built on that and we found that it was effective but not very uh, efficient. And so we ended up using what they're called noose carpets. And so they're essentially a small piece of wire mesh on which we tie a bunch of little nooses or lassos uh, and we place them out in the marsh and some of those photos of the rails standing on the open road rails are very territorial during the breeding season and so we take our little speaker and we play rail calls and the rails come out to check out who the new bird is and so we strategically place the speaker and the noose carpets and then as the birds come running in to check out this new intruder um, being the speaker, their feet get stuck uh, in those little lassos and we're able to catch the bird and quickly take them out of the trap. Um, and so that's been our primary trapping method. Very elaborate, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, so I'm trying to pair up the questions a little bit here. So one, do they use irrigation canals to nest, and two, do the agricultural fields or the runoff affect their health, like pesticide or insecticide wise? Okay, uh, those are, are good questions. So the first one is, do they use the irrigation canals to nest? And I think opportunistically, uh, they will. Um, they don't need a ton of cattail or bulrush to, to nest, and so Certainly along the Gila River, for example, near Phoenix, um, there's some very narrow uh, irrigation canals, drainage ditches in which we had as many as four or five pairs. Uh, and so um, I think if they had more habitat available, they might choose a, a little bit of a bigger patch of cattails, but they don't require uh, too much space. So yes, those irrigation canals are important breeding uh, habitats. The, the challenge with them is that the canals are frequently dredged or maintained to ensure there's good water flow. And so if that happens too frequently, the cattails can never get established um, and that can be a detriment to the birds. Um, and then the follow-up is, are they susceptible to pesticides, herbicides um, by foraging in these agricultural fields? And I'd say um, briefly, yes, somewhat. Um, there's elevated contaminants in sort of some pollutants in these irrigation um, canals. And it's, it's not very well studied. And in fact, at the Salton Sea in, in California, one of the projects I didn't mention is we're looking specifically at selenium, which is a heavy metal um, that is naturally elevated in the Colorado River. But by the time it gets circulated through all the ag fields and then uh, drains into the Salton Sea, uh, there are some, some questionably high, possibly dangerously high concentrations of selenium. So we were initiating a project this year. Unfortunately, it's been postponed um, to look at the effects of selenium on the reproductive success of rails. Um, so a short answer is probably, um, the longer answer is we don't quite know specifically how or why uh, those contaminants are affecting the birds. All right, so it was really interesting to see that they ended up just in random desert washes for pretty long periods of time. Do you have any idea what they might be eating while they're there? 
That is something I would love to uh, figure out. And so it's not entirely clear. Rails are pretty opportunistic. They, they love crayfish and clams and snails. Um, and small fish when they're in their sort of their breeding or their standard habitats. And so I'd imagine that they would eat sort of any small crustacean or invertebrate when they're stopping at ponds along the way south. But when they're stopping in open desert arroyos that don't have much more than a couple mesquite trees, I really don't know um, what they're eating. It's, it's quite possible that they're not eating birds um, and other species of migrants, be it fish or, or mammals, they, they perform some pretty remarkable feats during migration. And so it's not uncommon for birds to go several days to weeks without eating during migration. So there is a chance that these rails um, are just migrating and they're not eating, but it's something that uh, we don't know yet. Wow. I can't imagine going that long without eating. <laughs> no, me neither. Do they migrate alone? Uh, that's a good question. I think from the, the data we've gathered, they, we haven't had any of the transmitted birds migrate together. And so I think that they probably migrate more or less individually. Um, there's probably a peak couple of weeks where they're, they're leaving, um, but they're not a flocking bird. They, they don't hang out in flocks during the breeding season and so I would I do not believe that they migrate uh, in groups. Okay all right someone is asking will they be reclassified from freshwater marsh birds to something broader because of your research? I think they I, I think they do warrant a broader classification um, and to just be more broadly marsh birds. Um, and so there's already some, you know, it's a subspecies of a species and the species and, you know, it's a, it's a similar bird that's in San Diego. So um, it's not a stretch to just switch it from being considered a freshwater marsh bird to, to make it uh, a more broad uh, marsh bird generally. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you feel there's any chance this work can be extrapolated out to similar bird species, assuming the appetite for solar energy grows and take does not favor the rails, a reasonable assumption would be that cases for conservation of other rare birds would be necessary? Yes, certainly that's a really great question. Um, and so I, I mentioned it in the beginning that that accurately describing the, the life history and annual cycle of species is really challenging. And so we're getting better and better tracking technology with smaller and smaller transmitters. I mean, they make little transmitters that we can put on monarch butterflies now, which is blows my mind. Um, and also pairing that with genetic or isotopic analyses, we are we're gaining the tools necessary to really describe the movements of more species. And so I think that it, the desert Southwest um, is a really good example of an area that needs more research on the movement of birds. And so we're not alone. There are a lot of people looking at the effects of solar um, facilities on, on, on migrating birds. Uh, and so I think that there will be a need to do sort of targeted work like we are with single species, um, but also just in general, um, the, the work that's looking into how and why these solar facilities are, are attracting and, and killing birds is, is an ongoing body of research that I'm sure will continue. It, it needs to continue. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, what do you think is the reason only a portion seem to be migrating? Do you think they only migrate at certain ages? Or do you suspect different subpopulations simply have different habits? That's another good, insightful question. Um, and that is, I think there's a couple things going on. Some of that, the, we sort of estimate this minimum proportion of migrating birds um, from the birds that we, we know were alive in October and November and whether or not they moved. And so, our proportions are, are perhaps a low estimate given that some of those birds that were alive in November and then we just didn't see them move 
um, their transmitters may have just failed uh, and not registered them moving. But partial migration is uh, was what we would call this um, scenario when some of the population migrates and the other portion, and but not the whole population migrates. Um, partial migration is is a hot topic in avian literature. It's it's well debated, and and there's a lot of mechanisms that might drive that. Um, and uh, so I we certainly hope to continue. We now have the sample size to where we can maybe tease apart some of the reasons that only some of these birds migrate. And it, it probably, my guesses would be, it comes down to food availability um, in that some areas there's enough food to support um, the birds throughout the year and in others the food becomes scarce and so they're, they're forced to move. But that's a, an area of research we're actually hoping to explore um, this, this year. And if, if we're all forced to stay home, um, with COVID, then we'll have the chance to actually start looking into that data that we already have to, to look for patterns and, and explanations for that. All right, thank you. And I am going to follow up with one very last question. Okay. Um, and we'll end with an easy one. A few people have been asking, and I'm curious as well, if we could get a very brief introduction of the bird behind you. <laughs> Yes, uh, that is a great question. This is Blue. Um, he's an Amazon parrot. He's 18 years old and he belongs to my lovely girlfriend who's sitting here with me. Um, and he's he's been a good companion. I think we've grown closer in this, in this quarantine uh, forced stay at home order. Blue and I weren't necessarily best of friends before this started, but um, forcing us to live in the same small apartment together, we've, we've managed to become quite close. But he's, he's quite fun. He's... Can you say hello, Blue? Can you say hello? Say hello, hi, Blue. baby bird. How are you doing? He wanted to say hi earlier. He's, he's a little <laughs> shy, but... Yeah. yeah. Hello. Um, he is adorable. <laughs> Gosh. Well, thank you so much, Eamon. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you, Morgan other questions coming in in the chat, but I'm going to try and follow up with everyone after the presentation. For those of you who registered via Zoom, we're going to send an email um, with some additional information. I put some links in the chat if you're interested in more on Eamon's research, um, but I will send everyone an email as well as post it in the Facebook chat. And Eamon, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciated this. Um, I hope everyone is staying he healthy and safe out there, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to sit in on this. It's pretty exciting, interesting stuff. Yeah, we, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Eamon. All right.